his very own version of Theology on Tap, created in part because the name Theology on Tap is trademarked. But it's all right, we have our own version now, right? Um, before we get started, I just want to take a few moments uh, to thank a few people for the help in making this event possible. Uh, first, thank you so much to the kind employees of Pizzazz and Jake Speaking for the help in planning tonight. Um, and make sure you say thank you to Katie, our bartender tonight. Yes. Tip her well. Uh, next, I want to thank John Scrano and the campus ministry staff, um, especially Anna, who checked you guys in at the front today and gave you the stamp. She's the best. Uh, thanks to them for their support, uh, making this event possible from the very beginning. When I first asked John Scrano if we could do this, his immediate answer was, heck yes, we're going to make it happen. So he's a great guy. Definitely thank him. Um, and then thanks to you guys for your willingness to come out on a Monday night to think a little deeper regarding one of the fundamental aspects of our humanity, that is, our sexuality. Finally, I want to express my deep, deepest gratitude to Father Donald Cousins for his willingness to be the first speaker for this gathering. Since his ordination in 1965, Father Cousins has served the church in many roles, as a diocesan priest, professor, author, president and rector of Cleveland St. Mary Seminary, spiritual director, counselor, and retreat master. Recently retired as writer in residence and adjunct professor of theology here at Carroll, Father Cousins is a noted national and international commentator on religious and cultural issues, especially those relating to the sexual and financial crises gripping the Catholic Church. The New York Times says Donald Cousins is one of the most respected moderate voices on Catholic issues. His experience as vicar for clergy and as president director of Cleveland St. Mary Seminary led to his best-selling and award-winning book, The Changing Face of the Priesthood, published in 2000, which has been translated into eight languages. His later books include Faith That Dares to Speak, the award-winning Freeing Celibacy, and Notes from the Underground, the spiritual journal of a secular priest. Father Cousins' award-winning first novel, Master of Ceremonies, was published in 2015, and I believe he's actually currently working on another novel, so look out for that. Uh, Father Cousins has appeared twice on Tim Russert to Meet the Press, and has been interviewed on Fresh Air, All Things Considered, BBC Radio and Television, and CNN. Father Cousins has lectured throughout the US, in Ireland, England, Australia, Colombia, and India. We are exceedingly blessed to have Father Cousins with us this evening, a man who for so many of us is a great wisdom figure on campus. You might have spotted him in the Cor Corbo room or <laughs> on the racquetball court, beating Mark Spanheiser or in the camp. Some of you may have even taken or heard from other students about his famous Christian sexuality course. Luckily for those of us who have not had the opportunity to take the class, Father Cousins will touch on some of that content with us here tonight. Please join me in welcoming John Carroll's own Father Donald Cousins. said just say a few things about me, but he uh, wisely picked some uh, of the more significant parts of my past life. First of all, thank you for coming out here tonight. Um, as Anthony mentioned, I retired from John Carroll where I was an adjunct teacher in the theology department and I was writer in residence for almost 15 years. And so having a chance to speak to you tonight uh, takes me back a few years, and I'm very, very grateful uh, for this opportunity. Here's what I have in mind. I, I'd like to speak for maybe 25, 30 minutes, um, and then I think we're going to take a break so you can refill your plates or get something uh, more to drink. At that time, uh, there will be some discussion uh, questions that will be passed out to each of the tables, uh, or you can comment on what you've heard me say 
whether you feel it's authentic, real, unreal, uh, just what you think about it. But as Anthony said, we're here tonight to talk about something really significant and something that's difficult to talk about. While teaching Christian sexuality, I had a number of students say, you know, I have friends and classmates, and we'd like to talk about human sexuality, the pressures we face today as college students, and uh, it's pretty hard to have a serious conversation about that topic. And so tonight I would hope that I can somehow inspire a, a serious conversation about human sexuality. After that break, I would love to hear from you people. I'm eager to have a discussion with you. And I think some of you are thinking, I'm not sure I should have come tonight. What can a senior priest read old priests say about human sexuality? In fact, I think priests are the only people I know who can make sex boring. <laughs> but there's a part of tonight that I think will have an R rating. So if you're under 18, uh, let me know. <laughs> but I'd like to begin not with the R rated stuff. That'll come a little bit later. I'd like to begin with something more personal. If you are a math major, you probably calculated uh, my age. Um, so ordained in 1965. I'll just let it go at that. Um, but I knew two things in the first grade. I had a deep desire, even then, to be a priest. I felt it was my truth. In fact, I came home from school and my mother said, how did you like school after my first day of the first grade? And I said, I love it, I love it. And there's this cute girl in my homeroom, Joanne Mahoney. And I'm going to tell you I had a crush on Joanne for 12 years. First day of the first grade through senior year. Now, talk about the agony and the ecstasy. Because it's, I, I was really happy to have Joanne in my homeroom. But I was thinking of the priesthood. And the priesthood and celibacy go together like bacon and eggs. So they, they just kind of they just kind of go together. And if you don't mind my telling you this little anecdote, at our 10th high school reunion, I was ordained two years at that time, and Joanne Mahoney was married with two of her five children. But there was a slow dance at the reunion, and I asked Joanne to dance. And while we were dancing, I said, Joanne, I hope you realize that I had a crush on you for 12 years. I think I might have said I was in love with you for 12 years. <laughs> and you know what she did? She had the grace to say, now you tell me. <laughs> now, that was a very good lie. <laughs> you know, she said, uh, now you tell me. Well, I'm mentioning this little anecdote because somehow, for the last 50 some years, I've been thinking about how human sexuality and our sexual interest in other people, how that goes together with our spiritual lives. And I think many of you are trying to figure that out. How can I be a healthy, integrated, sexual person, and at the same time, be in communion with God. Uh, be the woman or the man that God wants me to be. And that isn't easy. And I'd like to suggest a little bit later that's probably harder for you than it might have been for some people who have gone before you. But I'd like to begin after that anecdotal note about the love life of Don Cousins. <laughs> I, I'd like to say just a little bit about the culture in which you live and I live. You see, there, there is a phenomenon today that you're all familiar with. It's called humanism, 
and I'm going to call it secular humanism. And if you're a philosophy major or a political science major, you might be saying that's a redundancy to say secular humanism. But I, there is a Christian humanism, so I'm going to stick with secular humanism. But you know what you and I hear a lot about today? And I'd like to speak briefly for your parents and your grandparents and all the people that love you. You know what they want for you? They want you to experience fullness in life. They want you to flourish. That's what your parents, grandparents want for you. That's what your teachers want for you. That's what I want for you. I want you to be able to say to yourself, my life is full. In fact, I think I'm flourishing. That means that you need a good career, good education, meaningful work, a good marriage, good romantic relationships. In fact, secular humanism says that's what it's all about. If you would like a full life, if you would like to flourish, then work really hard to get a good job, to be financially independent, find a good partner or spouse, and lead the good life, and you will have a full life, and you will flourish. I'd like to suggest, if that's what you settle for, you really won't have as full of a life as you might have. Because while secular <coughs> humanism is saying, folks, that's all there is, Christianity says, no, that's not all there is. Christianity is saying, the gospel has something to say to you. The gospel's 2,000 years old, and I think there's a great deal of wisdom there. So I'm hoping tonight to say a little bit to you about how to achieve fullness in life and how to really flourish. And some of it might sound contrary to secular humanism, because, quite frankly, it is contrary to secular humanism. So here we are, struggling to lead a full life, to flourish, and what do we find? Well, we find we have I think, for most of you here, a desire for God, uh, a desire for spirituality, a desire to connect with your family and your friends on a deep level. And I think you have been given a great insight into the secret of the gospel, that you can't be flourishing and enjoy the fullness of life without being a person for others. So there's a paradox there. I think most of you here tonight might agree with that. Now, if you don't agree with that, and if you do think that secular humanism is really what it's about, and clergymen and pastors, rabbis and imams are talking about fluffy stuff in the sky. Uh, I want to respect that, because there are an awful lot of good people who don't see it that way. And so you might really politely disagree with me. And I understand that, because of the situation in which we live. So how then do we somehow integrate and bring together our sexual energy, our sexual desire, our sexual curiosity, our sexual experiences, and relate that to our interior life. 
where we stand in communion with God and with other people. When I was a young man in high school, in love with Joanne Mahoney, my friends and I had a certain approach given to us in class. No sex, no sex until you're married. Today, that doesn't seem to, to be the case. Uh, and so what I'd like to suggest to you tonight, that you listen to what I am about to say from the standpoint of whether or not it speaks to your desire to have a full life. The wisdom of Christianity when it comes to human sexuality is not to repress your sexuality or to encourage you to live like a monk or a nun. That's not what it's about. It's more than that. So I like to see just where that takes us tonight. I want to say something that you've all heard before. Sex is good. Sex is very good. Sex is one of the most ecstatic pleasures human beings can have. At the same time, I'm saying that, and the reason I'm saying that is because there are many people who feel that sex isn't good. It's kind of a necessary evil to propagate the human species. So sex is kind of icky and you don't want to go there, but we have to have sex, otherwise the human race would shrink up. Sex is good, but sex is potentially dangerous. It's dangerous in the sense that this good reality can hurt you and it can hurt other people. And I think almost everyone here tonight shakes. One time or another has been hurt directly or indirectly when it comes to human sexuality. Maybe there's been sexual abuse, maybe sexual violence. And maybe the hurt that you've experienced comes from infidelity in a relationship, uh, maybe jealousy. Uh, for a long time, I've been a counselor as a clergyman and as a psychologist. I'd like to tell you one of the hardest, most wrenching pain an individual can experience is the pain of jealousy. Have you ever felt that you were really falling into a relationship and that you were coming to love someone more than they loved you back? And even if that person assures you that he or she loves you, Every time you see him or her in a serious conversation with another, ooh, something going on, and I feel threatened. And that can be terribly painful. And imagine if you're married and you go to a party, you see your spouse, engaged in a really significant conversation and you suspect that he or she is flirting, it drives you crazy. And so sex is wonderful. It's God's creation, but it can also, also hurt. And so I would like to ask you tonight, to think about asking God for the grace to love well. I think one of the things that we can do to help us integrate our love for God 
and our love for another person, when we feel erotic or sexual energy, for someone we're in a relationship with is to say, God help me to love this person well. I think you know what I mean by that. I think if you love another person well, you're going to respect her or him. You're going to be, try to be honest about the affection that you share and the sexual experiences that you might have. So you're respecting each other and you're honest with each other. And this might sound strange to you, but I know couples in college who pray together, and go to the nine o'clock mass on Sunday together. And they have discovered sometimes the closest they feel to their boyfriend or girlfriend is when they're simply holding hands or cuddling on a couch or kissing. And both people know that there's discipline here. And something good. I've heard people say, I have felt so close to my special other as we walked around the campus at midnight. But then I had a more explicit sexual experience at a hookup, some party I went to. I didn't feel like I was flourishing. I didn't feel I was me uh, at my best. So the wisdom of the gospel is something I would hope that you would take seriously And it's hard. I believe it's really difficult. Um, I don't have to tell you that we live in a sex-saturated culture. Uh, you could say that every culture is sexually saturated, and to an extent that's true. But the culture you live in, take a look at advertising and media, TV and film, lyrics to some of the music that you listen to. You think of theme parties, and the experiences middle school children are having. Uh, you think of high school students. Articles in the Atlantic Monthly and Dr. Phil and Oprah Winfrey talking about the prevalency of oral sex in middle school and high school. And I'd like to say it is possible to have a full life and to flourish without being sexually active. Think about that. Some people say, I do want a full life. I do want to flourish, therefore I have to have sex. And sometimes I think everybody's having sex, and, or at least they're having more sex than I'm having. And I want to say, try not to think that way. Because relationships that are good and solid and healthy, they come to you as well as you go out to them. So I know it isn't easy today. I don't think there's as much sexual curiosity among college students as there was 50 years ago. And I say that because of the prevalence of pornography today. I think college students pretty much know all there is to know about the basics of human sexuality. And so you know a lot, and it's kind of all around you. And I think many of you are asking God for the grace, help me to be a healthy 
sexual person. Help me uh, to love well. Help me to understand that my sexual desire is not that different from my desire for communion with God. I'm hoping that you can come home from a party where maybe you've had something to drink, maybe you've done some flirty, maybe to a greater or lesser extent there's been maybe a hookup, but you walked home happy because you were still at the same time a disciplined person. Sometimes when a college student has gotten to know me well, they might have taken the course I taught, Christian sexuality. Sometimes, it's usually a young woman, she might stop in at my office and say, and this has happened, you know, Father Cousins, just like you said in class, I was dating this guy, and it was great. We had the best relationship. Yeah, we kissed and cuddled and exchanged affection. I knew he wanted to touch my body. I knew he wanted to see me naked. Yeah. We didn't go there. We just didn't go there. And for the longest time, it was wonderful. But then, on one occasion, you know, we, we did it. We had intercourse. And it changed our relationship. It changed our relationship. You know, this sexual, the secular humanism culture I referred to at the beginning of my talk. It says, you don't have to have a relationship. In fact, relationships complicate sex. I think that's one of the reasons why the hookup culture is so strong for young adults today. And even though the research shows that most men as well as women don't really like the hookup culture. Hey, what else is there? For some reason, you guys don't date anymore. And I think dating, I'm not sure why college students don't date. I think dating is awkward. First of all, if you want to ask someone out on a date, it can be the most courageous thing you've ever done. I had three dates with Joanne Mahoney. First time I had a date with her, I called her on the phone. I was a sophomore in high school. Hello, Joanne. Cousins, hi, how are you? I'm oh, good, I'm good too. I was just wondering if you would like to go to a movie with me. Hell, I wasn't just wondering. <laughs> I was hoping with all my heart. <laughs> so have you I had a, I asked another girl out once. She said, no, I can't go out with you on Thursday night. That's the night I wash my hair. <laughs> and so I said, well, can I talk to your sister? <laughs> So I, I hope you hear what I'm trying to say today. Um, let me try to just summarize this part of our evening here. Own who you are. You are a person with a spirit. You are a person with a body. 
and your spirit and your body are so tightly intertwined that they both need to flourish together. Be patient with yourself if you've made mistakes in the past or if you're in a relationship today that is one mistake after another. Respect yourself and your values and ask Jesus to be with you uh, as you become an adult, integrated, sexual person. And for many of you, that includes being an adult, integrated, sexual Christian. Being the woman or man that God wants you to be. I think I'm going to um, say just a little bit about chastity here, and then we'll take uh, that break that Anthony and I mentioned earlier. I am sure that not all of you are sexually active, and if you're not sexually active, sometimes a college student is embarrassed by that. Don't be, don't be embarrassed. I think that if you are not in a relationship, if you're not sexually active, you might be one of the happiest people on campus. And if you're not in a relationship, and if you're not sexually active, think of it as a form of Christian poverty. God knows you're a needy person, a human person, and at this stage in my life, I'm not in a relationship. I'm not sexually active. And that's okay, because my values are that unless you are in a relationship you're going to experience sex without meaning. And some people say, yeah, that's the way I like it. No meaning, no emotional entanglement, no one to text the next day. Just recreational sex. I don't think that's the way most of you look at it. I think, I think that God is asking you to have a heart that's open to romance and authentic intimacy and fidelity and the joy of knowing someone loves you and you love that person back. I once found myself in a restaurant uh, and the tables were close. I think you know how sometimes the tables are lined up. I was sitting there reading a magazine, and there was this young couple next to me. And they were either recently engaged, or maybe, uh, maybe just married. But at one point, they reached across the table, and they took each other's Hands. And one said to the other, and I don't remember if it was the man or the woman, said, thank you for loving me. And the other person responded, I couldn't help it. That's, that's what I think you want. Somebody who says, I couldn't help but love you. Now, I been a priest for a long time. I'm sitting there thinking, I'm going to fast forward 25 years, and this couple goes out to celebrate their 25th wedding anniversary. And during the meal, one of them says to the other, thank you for loving me. And the response comes back, you're welcome. <laughs> Well, anyway, thank you for paying attention. What I'd like to suggest now is that you try to filter some of the things I've said. You might want to say, Father Cousins, 
you look like a nice guy, but you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and I certainly will accept that. Anthony is now uh, going to pass out some discussion questions that you might want to use, or you might want to reflect a little bit on what I've said. And then, um, then we're going to get back together in about 15 or 20 minutes, and I'd love to have some feedback.